incredible. In that 10 years, we've raised $2.3 million. Right? And that money, as you know, has funded some very important equipment at our hospital. The mammography machine, vital signs monitors, um, the ventilators that we had ordered before we needed them through the crisis of our pandemic and most recently our orthopedic surgical equipment. So these are big deal items. I can tell you though from the videos we've seen, even the sterilizers, right? And we were just recently at Suzanne's retirement celebration, 31 years, and she can walk through that hospital and not one single piece of equipment stands in that hospital that has not been fundraised for from this foundation and your support. So thank you, it's incredible, thank you. As you know, or most of you know, and this is part of you know being ambassadors and learning, coming together with through shared experience and learning opportunities to understand what are the ins and outs of our healthcare system and people that support wellness in our community. We believe our community deserves the best, and we are trying to accomplish that. Um, what most people don't know is that almost every dollar raised goes to equipment in that hospital because our government does not equip us to have these items in our hospitals. We have to do that through private donations in the support of our community. So thank you. Another way, fundraising, Julie helped to remind me this, sometimes we get, oh, I don't want to go ask for money or you know, do the handouts or do these things. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable, uh, but it's not as needed as we've just discussed. What also is needed is friend raising, right? So please, Feel free to join us at any level of participation and invite friends to these types of experiences. All are welcome. It not only takes the financial support, but the absolute backing of our volunteers who help to make these events possible. So just that, you know, it's two sides of the equation that really bring this all together. And for those of you who are thinking of joining us in Circle of Life, we make it very easy for you to sign up on the spot tonight. <laughs> so, there's Rob. <laughs> so thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy your experience. I love that this is really um, something that t tickles all my senses. Not only is it accessible and meaningful for everybody, not just businesses and those of affluence, but everybody. Um, I love that we get to have experience that we gather in community and connection and that with purpose we make an impact. And we get to have fun along the way. So this is one of my favorite um, you know, gifts that we do that contributes to the hospital in a really great way. And now, without further ado, I would like you to introduce you to Julie Pazinski, our new CEO to the Guelph General Hospital Foundation. I just wanted to say a quick hello. I asked Rob if I could sneak in the program. You're really here to hear from all of our other speakers tonight. But I've met most of you, and I look forward to meeting you who I haven't met yet. Um, I heard about this group, this mysterious secret of uh, Circle of Life group, a number of years ago before I started working here, and I've always been curious about it. And um, now as CEO, I'm, I'm proud to say my husband and I signed up today, and so join you as Circle of Life members. Um, it was really simple with a monthly donation and i um, very delighted to join you in this very special group. So um, I know that this group, one thing that you all have in common is a special place in, the, in your heart that you have for our hospital and you are very keenly interested to hear about what's happening at the hospital right now and what's coming up. So it's my pleasure to introduce Miriam Walker, our CEO, who's here for an update from the hospital. Thank you again for being here and look forward to getting to know you better. Uh, so a couple things that are going on at the hospital. You might wonder what's going on with COVID. The good news is the numbers are going down. Uh, we, you know, if I think about a month ago or two months ago, we would have up to 30 patients. Now it's about six to eight, so that's good news, and very few in ICU. So um, what we're finding is these, the methods that we have for vaccination and masking and all that has been working, so that's, that's good news. Um, the one thing that you're gonna hear about is on June 11th, there's gonna say the masking mandate for hospitals will be lifted, uh, and, and that's what the sort of the in terms of the medical officer of health has said. However, uh, consulting with our medical officer of health 
and our infectious disease physicians and what have you, and we know how COVID is spread, we will still be requiring masks when you come into the hospital. And the reason for that is think about you have the most vulnerable people who come into our building um, or who come for care. We don't want visitors coming into our building and spreading that. And that once, if we have an outbreak, uh, the issue is we're trying to resume surgeries because we've had to um, shut down surgery several times through all these waves. <laughs> And so if we get outbreaks, we can't continue that process. Or if our staff get COVID, they're not there to care for the patient. So you'll see that we'll continue that, that masking um, policy. And we're asking, we're asking everyone to be kind to our staff when they are saying, why do I have to wear a mask? I don't have to wear it at the grocery store. We are, we are different, so. Um, the other thing that's happening is patient volumes. Interesting, the COVID numbers are down, but our patient volumes are up. And what that means, our hospital is really full. And if you, can, if you have to come to emergency, uh, you are going to have a long wait time. And that's not just at Guelph General, that's throughout the whole province. And so uh, what we're finding is many of those patients also need admission, and our hospital is full. And so our teams are doing the best they can working with our community to keep that flow flow going. But it is it is a significant challenge for, for us and, and many hospitals. So some exciting things that are happening. Uh, one is our special care nursery, and, and I'm not sure if any of you had the opportunity to come and take a hammer to start demolishing it. So we've started that uh, demolish, we started to demolish. And so they're now starting to, they're still doing some demolition, but hoping that soon we'll start that redevelopment. So it's so exciting for our little ones are going to be able to stay with their parents um, and their families in separate rooms versus if any of you have been in that area, used to be curtains and a, and a little station in between and that's all there, all there was, very crowded. So uh, lots happening there. Um, and then we're working on our emergency department and mental health. You've heard me say this before. Our emergency department was built for about 40, 45,000 visits. We're up to about 64,000. And so um, we're working through that expansion. The build hasn't started yet, but the good news is the ministry has committed the dollars to it. So we're working through that process with the ministry to get that approved. Um, the other exciting thing is we, the board has just passed a new strategic plan for the organization and mission and vision. And so we're, you'll hear about that uh, in, in weeks to come uh, because we're just working on the communication plan. But we're quite excited about that too. So you already heard this, we couldn't do, we couldn't do what we do without you, without the donors. Um, as Julie said and Alicia said, every piece of equipment comes from a donor. And it has made such a difference if I, it, it makes a difference every single day. And I'll, I'll have to say during COVID, uh, you really, your donations saved lives. And I'm talking about when we needed ventilators, when we needed special beds to position patients uh, when they were inflicted with very serious COVID symptoms. Um, it really made a difference. And so just wanted to, to thank you uh, for that. And the other thing is, um, Another example is last year, the orthopedic surgery equipment was actually sponsored by the Circle of Life, and it has really helped people's mobility. And if you think about people who need their hip replaced or their knees replaced, they, they are suffering in the community or they, they don't have the same quality of life. And so by that donation of that equipment, it makes um, recuperation much faster and um, then improves the quality of life of people. And uh, so the other thing I, I will mention is some of, because some of you have asked, oh, when am I retiring? Because you heard I was retiring. <laughs> and um, so the process has just started and most likely late fall. I told the board I won't leave until there's someone in my seat. And uh, so uh, the goal is though this year by December, hopefully at Christmas, I don't have to worry about being on call. So <laughs> that, would be the, that would be my goal. Um, so again, thank you, thank you again so much for your being here and also your ongoing support of the hospital. So now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Ian Digby, and he's one of our fabulous physicians. I've known Ian for eight years almost, um, and he has been with the hospital over 20 years, 
and he also served as the chief of the emergency department from 2011 to 2019, and that's not easy to do. Um, that's a lot of work, and, and he's made, from his leadership, he's really made that ED department one of a stellar one that many organizations came to see because we were doing so well. Um, we have some work now because of all the flow issues, but uh, still, so such good things that Ian has done. So he's going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the emergency room and how we're responding to youth mental health. So, Ian. Just start by saying thank you again to everyone for your contributions to the hospital. It, it really is powerful uh, to, to see the great success of the foundation campaign that just rang in, $37 million, that's a lot of money. And all of you for being part of Circle of Life each year, it really does change the things that Marianne and, and Julia has, have spoken about. Really, uh, we see it everywhere, there's little stickies all over our equipment all through the hospital that say this was given by a donor. And did you know that making donations, being philanthropic is good for your health? <laughs> when you make that gift, you have a, a rise in your endorphins and a better sense of well-being in the world. I don't know if this is statistically valid, but there's probably a, a, a lifespan increase by giving to <laughs> your whole life. So keep doing what you're doing. This is good for you. And um, we're going to give you a little bit of uh, an introduction to a, an exciting new project that is happening. Um, it's started and is being built over the course of, uh, uh, there's actually construction happening right now to, to support this. And this is focusing on uh, youth mental health in our region. And um, we have, a, as you can imagine, there's a lot of pressures on youth these days. And we, we've found that the methods that we have used for many years are, have not been as successful as they could have been to stabilize young people in their, in their challenges. So we'll stay right there, Mr. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, our two speakers, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of go through a little description of what's going on in our region about this and a new opportunity that is arising. So Cindy Moffat Forsyth is going to be speaking about the Grove Hubs, which are uh, the, the new program that's going to be uh, hoping a, a significant change maker for youth in our in our region. And Helen Fishburn will be uh, speaking about the work that Canadian Mental Health Association is doing in alliance with the hospital and with the Grove Hub. So, Helen, do you want to speak first? First of all, thanks so much for inviting Cindy and I to join you in this conversation. It's uh, actually a wonderful representation of our partnership with the hospital. Uh, sometimes hospitals, you know, tend to think about their own building and, and what they're doing. But I can tell you, Marianne and her team are so community-minded. The door in, the door out, uh, and understanding the whole spectrum. So uh, inviting us into this conversation tonight is just a great example of that, and we're really, really grateful. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to start, and we're going to talk, Cindy and I are just going to talk about uh, what we're seeing with children and youth mental health across our community. My job is to kind of paint the picture or give you a bit of a snapshot of what's happening. And I will say, it's not a pretty snapshot. There's been a huge impact and toll of the pandemic on our uh, kids and our youth. So I'll just talk about that. And of course, there's always good news to share as well. Um, but first and foremost, we know it's been an exhausting two and a half years. And certainly not just for those of us that work in the healthcare space. There's not a single person hasn't been disrupted, distressed, overwhelmed, exhausted, fed up uh, in the last two years. I mean, I don't think any of us could have ever imagined this journey, uh, knowing what we know now of what we've been through. Certainly, people that are more vulnerable have suffered even more and struggled even more over the past two and a half years. Um, but certainly, the cumulative impact, uh, the toll of what we've all been carrying is very real. Uh, and very heavy. And you know, I've been in this uh, community working for about 25 years. I've been 20 years at CMHA, which is hard to believe. I know I'm very young, but uh, 20 years is a long time. I have never seen it like this in my career. It is, it is something else. 
with that, uh, we see the world differently now. Our perspective has changed just because of the experience that we've had. <clears throat> we've been, you know, think about what we've been dealing with, a, a global pandemic, racial injustice, rising housing prices and inflation, uh, the freedom convoys, divisions about vaccines, a horrific war in Ukraine, mass shootings in the United States. This, like, it's just layers upon layers of things that have been such a worry and a concern and a stress for us. It's like a wet blanket when you add all those layers and, and people carry that. And it's really become some, uh, something that's dominated our lives, uh, that stress and that worry. Uh, now, I will say, that in the perspective part, and I'm certainly an optimist, so we always have to look at things and, and see what we've learned from them, and we do have some learnings. The first is that good can come out of any evil, and we've seen that through COVID. You know, when you think of the scientific breakthroughs of our vaccines and the incredible innovation in our community coming together, there's so many examples. Self-care is not self-indulgent. Self-care has actually been something that we've needed and required. We've all changed on the dime to embrace these changes. When you think about two and a half years ago, you know, most of us didn't know what COVID was, PPE, you know, physical distancing, masking. Now that's just part of our life and part of what we do every day. Technology is not just a friend, it's a lifeline. And certainly in the mental health space, it has absolutely been something that's kept, literally kept people alive uh, through the pandemic. The bonds of community and family are stronger than we realized, and we certainly have needed each other uh, through this pandemic. And of course, we've learned that mental health is health. Sometimes uh, in our mental health space, we, we are in the shadows of the healthcare system, just because it's hard to define. You know, we've been uh, listening to Ian and our, and our foundation chair talk about you know, the physical equipment that been able to purchase through donations, which is so awesome. Mental health it isn't quite as concrete. It's more gray. It's, it's not as tangible. And it can make people feel uncomfortable, not quite sure how to address things. So that's something we struggle with as well, and then, of course, stigma. We, uh, through all of this and through this new perspective, we need to think about how uh, our work, how this changes our work, what this does to the way we operate, the way we live. And as you all know, the most vulnerable have been the most impacted. And it's very simple. It's called trauma. It's that simple. But of course, that goes down deep. And you know, for people like seniors in long-term care homes, children and youth in our community, people who are medically vulnerable, business owners who've lost their livelihoods, there's been so many vulnerable groups, and, and it really has been traumatic for them. And I will say, uh, the pandemic has hit us all but it has not hit us all equally. And those vulnerable groups certainly have been much harder and hit much deeper. And we'll you know, certainly unpack that tonight with children and youth. We know there's a family impact as well. Uh, I always think of our parents, and I see this with, with our own staff. They've been professional jugglers through the pandemic, right? They've got their own jobs. They've got their kids. Their kids have been in school, out of school, vaccinated, not vaccinated, uh, and are the parents have had to manage their jobs. Some have been uh, working virtually and their kids have been home. Some have had to put layers and layers of PP on and go to work. Some have lost their jobs. All of our parents are managing that. And then we have aging parents that we're supporting as well. It's been a huge, huge load for our parents to manage. And many have had to take leaves from work from their jobs just to be able to manage, which of course has an economic impact on our community as well. So when you think about what we're seeing in our youth, I'll just give you some general stats and then I'm gonna share three areas that we're really worried about uh, within our children and youth. General stats, um, when you look at our pre and post COVID volumes, uh, and this is uh, just to give a bit of context, at, children, at CMHA we are the official children's mental health provider. We have about 460 staff at CMHA, about 80 work in our children's mental health service and we extend from the city of Guelph right through to Wellington County, just to give you a bit of context. Uh, so in our counseling and treatment stream and our pathway, 146% higher volumes than we had prior to COVID. Child psychiatry and psychology, 96% increase in our volumes. And in our family support, 56%. So 
56%. I could go on and on, and again, the numbers are absolutely staggering, but that just gives you a snapshot. I would say, generally speaking, across the board, we're about 40% higher with our overall community volumes. Some of you might have heard about Here 24-7, which is our front door to the mental health and addiction system locally. Prior to COVID, we used to get about 3,500 calls into Here 24-7 monthly. Now, we get about 6,500 calls. And those are people that are looking for crisis support, mental health supports, addiction supports, for themselves, for their family members, for their next door neighbor, for the guy sitting next to them in the cubicle. It's everyone. 3,500 to 6,500, that's our new baseline. So let's talk about uh, some specific populations. Uh, imagine needing services when you're in the zero to six category. You think of zero to six, you do not think mental health and child psychiatry, but sadly that is the new reality. And it's actually one of the longest waiting lists we have in our children's mental health service. It's over a year long. What we're seeing with these little kids, two-year-olds, is an increase in anxiety, dark feelings, and acting out behavior. You have to keep in mind too that many of the kids uh, who rely on social interactions, right, for their developmental growth and uh, to work through their transitions in life, haven't had that. They've been at home with stressed out parents and in a totally different world. So that's also part of that whole context in which they live in, which of course impacts their developmental uh, trajectory and not to say that parents shouldn't be stressed out. They have reason to be stressed out, that's for sure. In the next category, we're seeing uh, higher behaviors in 13 and 15 year olds. That's the other real spike that we've seen. And this looks very different than the little kids um, because of course, as you all know, this gets played out in social media. Um, so in this population, we're seeing high rates of volumes with females and with youth identifying with transgender in general. Um, and we're seeing more aggressive behavior, actual physical fights on the school grounds, uh, bullying and cyber threats. Uh, and of course at this age, again because of the developmental issues, we know that kids tend to act out more than they act in. And we're certainly seeing that um, a real spike. Uh, and I know in the hospital as well, the kids that go over to Cape, uh, go over to the Grand River Hospital, for in inpatient admission, it's largely in this age group as well. The other group to share uh, the patterns and trends we're seeing is kids uh, between the ages of 16 and 24. And I know kids, uh, you know, because if you're 24, sometimes you don't feel a kid, but when you're a youth uh, and you're leaving school and you're kind of transitioning, we, uh, we put them into this category because there's, there's such a, a huge transition element here. Most kids in this age group are graduating from high school, leaving their parents' house, moving on to college, university, or a job. But again, we've really seen that stunted through the pandemic. Uh, I really call it a failure to launch. Kids have, you know, who should normally be leaving their parents' house, have been going down to the basement, right? They've been doing their learning online. They've been doing, trying to find jobs in a market where there hasn't been any. They're disconnected from their friends and their networks, which is so important at this age. So what happens with this group is that uh, they turn to other ways to find comfort, and that isolation is really impacted. And so we're seeing higher rates of substance use, particularly cannabis, which then spikes our early psychosis presentations and really high presentations of eating disorders, which is linked to uh, youth feeling a lack of control. When you have a lack of control in the overall context, you're looking for ways you can find control, mm -hmm. and so there's a, a real strong control issue relating to eating disorders. We've seen a massive spike in our eating disorders program because of that. I talked about parents, but it's worth mentioning again that we're seeing parents developing their own mental health and addiction issues, and again, uh, just from that exhaustion and depletion that they're feeling. Um, we certainly hear from a lot of moms. They call us in here 24 seven. They identify their stress. They seek that help quite often. We also know that dads are there struggling as well. We don't hear from dads as much, and that's a worry for us. We always feel better when we hear uh, from dads and want to engage them as well. So the risk of doing all of this for you guys tonight is that this is the most depressing presentation you've ever heard. 
<clears throat> and I'm sorry about that. However, in mental health circles, we really do just like to call it, uh, and we need to call it. That's part of uh, what we struggle with, is just reducing that stigma and putting the cards on the table. You know, when you think of somebody who's, who's broken an arm or who's had surgery uh, because of a ruptured appendix, you would just talk about that very openly. You know, how's your arm healing? How did the surgery go? How are you doing today? We don't do that in mental health uh, as much. Now, we're making progress, and we've certainly made progress in terms of stigma, but we have to do so much more of it. So part of what we need to do tonight is just what I've done, is just name it. Just talk about it. Just be that clear about what these issues are. And know that mental health is health. All the struggles that we've just I've just talked about tonight are there. We also know that kids are incredibly resilient. They're our little superheroes. Um, they bounce back. Parents bounce back. But we know that they need things in order to make that happen. And I will say, going back to the optimism part, I am definitely uh, somebody who sees the silver lining, and the silver lining in this whole pandemic is that there is a renewed compassion and empathy for mental health now. For the first time, many people that have called us in that 146% increase, in the 96% increase, and the more here 24-7 calls, for the first time in their lives, they finally understand what it feels like <coughs> to be overwhelmed with anxiety and to be in such a dark place of depression. And as sad as that is, it has opened up the conversation for us in mental health. And we'll take that. We've been waiting for this moment. Uh, it's sadly, it took a global pandemic to get here and more suffering, which we never want, but we're here. So the door is open for us to have this conversation and to really embrace uh, the struggle and to really talk about it. Uh, and with that, we've seen individuals, families, companies, hockey teams, everybody, uh, be so kind, be so generous, reach out to each other. I, I could go on and on about the amount of kindness we've seen, like kids showing up with their birthday money in an envelope, uh, women just showing up with masks at the beginning of the pandemic. It is so important in the mental health space and in healthcare in general. Um, and I, I will say it's usually a lot easier for me to find that balance than it's been in the pandemic. It feels like the sweet spot is about the size of a postage stamp these days. However, uh, it's there, and I will tell you um, that it's really going to take all of us to address this gap and to address these issues, certainly with our children and youth and the parents, but, but everyone across our community. There's a couple things that we need, and you'll notice in the picture there's a net there, uh, and that's just, I like to use uh, visual images when I talk about these needs, because to me it, it's more powerful. But I always think of kids who need that safety net, right? What are we doing to create that safety net for our kids? There's a couple things that I'll suggest, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy, who's created the biggest safety net in our community. But we need our federal, provincial, and municipal governments to work together on this. It's not gonna take one. It's gonna take all three government levels of government to work together. It's gonna to take us as a community strongly advocating for mental health and addiction needs just as we're doing for physical health, just as we're doing for other areas. And I know that the, the pot is an endless of money out there. However, mental health needs to be on equal footing uh, with the other needs. Um, and we also need uh, really strong innovation, like public and private partnerships. We can't rely on Doug Ford to write us a big check to solve this problem. However, um, we need Doug Ford to solve some of it, and then we need to innovate with our partners. Many of you have seen and know that we're building a new children's mental health center on Woolwich Street in the north end of Guelph. You'll see it uh, there, uh, the old McDonald's building uh, that's down, and we're putting that building up. Uh, we're opening uh, early next year. All of our children's mental health team will be there, and we'll have uh, our youth wellness hub on the main floor of the building. We're going to serve about 9,000 kids and parents uh, out of that site per year. And that building happened because of an innovative partnership that we developed with Robert Eilers at Vistera. Uh, that's the only reason that building happened. It didn't happen because the government gave us money to do it. We had to lean into this partnership, which is just so amazing. We also need to do really aggressive fundraising. So thank you to all of you who are donors in our community. We couldn't do this work without you, and we need that 
financial support to fill this gap. Um, and of course, it's not just about money as well. It's about changing the culture of mental health and the conversations. And certainly all of us uh, can do that. You know, that conversation about the broken arm and how we're doing with each other and what we need from each other. Each of us can uh, hold that space together and be part of those conversations, which you don't need to do with each other. You can just do uh, with each other over a cup of tea or coffee. So I'm going to turn the rest of the presentation over to Cindy, who's going to talk about the Youth Wellness Hub, which is part of a new program to serve children and youth and more. The Grow. So what we're seeing uh, is um, through the pandemic, and through the isolation, youth lost that sense of belonging. And so that's what our sites are all about. So we have, we are, eventually when everything is up and running, we'll have seven sites. We started with three in Wellington County, and since September of 2021, we've seen over 9,000 youth visits in Wellington County alone. So that means that youth walks in the door and they've accessed our services somehow. We've got a site in Erin, a site in Fergus, and a site in Palmerston. And all of those sites work together. So our staff traveled to those sites, they talked to each other, were connected with CMHA, so our clinical team are actually CMHA employees, so they get all the benefits of the training and the infrastructure of CMHA, but most importantly, they are connected to CMHA's database because one of our key pillars was to make sure that mental health professionals no matter what agency they work for, could um, uh, talk to each other, access youth files with permission, so that they could see what was happening um, with the youth and help them in a holistic way. So the growth model, we are an official site of Youth Wellness um, Hubs Ontario, but we, we're the next evolution. And how we became the next evolution is, of the sites that are in Ontario right now, it's, it's a, they're standalone sites, they're one. Uh, except for downtown Toronto. Um, when, uh, in January of 2019, um, Joanna Henderson and I met with Lloyd Longfield, and Lloyd Longfield asked Joanna a pivotal question, and that's how we got to where we are today. He said, what's the next evolution of these youth hubs? And she said, we're missing three things. Rural access, so we're not servicing rural youth well anywhere in Canada. So for heaven's sakes, don't build a great big site in downtown Guelph because you'll be missing way too many youth. So that's where we got the seven doors one site and lots of agencies um, stepped up to the plate and said, like East Wellington Community Services, and said we're building a youth hub in Erin, let's join forces. Uh, Minto Township said we've got a big problem up here with youth mental health, why don't we get together and therefore we became um, uh, the Grove in Palmerston. And then CMHA stepped up to the plate in Fergus, along with Skyline Group of Companies, and helped us build um, the, the site in Fergus. The second focus is on that trans transitional age youth that Helen talked about. Um, I have personal experience from this. I have a daughter um, who has uh, mental health issues. She's now 30, um, but starting in, at about 10 or 11, um, she started to show um, quite severe signs of stress. Um, and of course, I thought it was a discipline problem to start with, uh, and then when that didn't work, we went through this incredible journey of me trying to figure out how to help her. I had countless professionals tell me, well, she's just not sick enough. Well, if you're a parent who's proactive, you don't want them to get that sick. Anyways, when she hit the age of 18, uh, my whole world plummeted because now um, professionals wouldn't talk to me because she was an adult. And that's what we're talking about with the transitional age youth. They, they graduate, they become 18 years old, they graduate out of the children uh, youth um, uh, safety net or the, the services there, and then they're expected to navigate the adult system. And I will tell you, I've tried to navigate the adult system over the last 10 years with my daughter, and it's a tough, tough system to navigate. So that is my passion um, for bringing the Grove to, um, to a Guelph and Wellington County. I cannot say enough 
that this partnership would not have happened, that the, the growth wouldn't have happened without the leadership of the Rotary Club of Guelph, CMHA, the Guelph Y, like we just have some amazing partners. Um, Linamar is a huge, huge supporter of ours um, and, and really bringing uh, the growth to life. And the third piece I talked about was the technology piece. Uh, COVID, you know, I, I, I agree with Helen on the silver lining. Uh, COVID did push us that we can now offer counseling online, and some youth do still want counseling uh, virtually. Most of them want to come in person, but that opened up a whole avenue for us. We can talk to our doctors on the phones and, and over Zoom. Um, but the real focus is bringing everybody onto one system so that we can share information. And I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, about three weeks ago, we had a youth who had been seeing our youth outreach worker um, at one of our sites. And uh, that youth outreach worker had been working with this youth um, in a consistent way. And the last time they saw them was on a Thursday afternoon and the youth was stable and doing fine. On Friday night, that youth called here 24-7 in crisis. The operator at, at uh, here 24-7 was able to access, with the youth's permission, their file that our youth outreach worker had been working on with. So therefore, was to be able to take that youth from what had been happening and knew what their background was to help stabilize them, diverting them from a hospital visit, and then stabilizing them for the weekend. On Monday morning, our youth outreach worker logged into the system. There was a flag there saying that this youth had called here 24-7 in crisis, was stable now, and then our youth outreach worker contacted the youth right away and had the youth come in after school. That is the type of care that we need to be providing to our youth. That, that is what this is about. The model um, of Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario is an evidence-based model. So it's been studied, researchers have studied it, it's, it, is, um, it, it really is evidence-based. The data is there, it's very clear what's happening. But this system is about intervention and prevention. We're not about crisis. So yes, if somebody walks in and I've got countless um, examples of youth coming in in crisis and we make sure that we give them a warm handoff and make sure that they're connected to the right services. But what we want to do and why I really like this model, it's about intervention and prevention. It's about being proactive. So a 13 year old walks in the door and says, exams are coming up and I'm panicking and I, I'm starting to feel anxious. Let's sit down with that youth and let's walk them through. Here are some coping strategies. And here's what you can do to try to manage your beginning stages of anxiety. And this is how, here, let us introduce you to our tutor. And let us talk to you about um, how to uh, uh, be proactive and, and have talk about that self-care that Helen uh, talked about earlier. Uh, therefore, you don't get that youth undiagnosed anxiety getting to university and being curled up in a ball on their residence um, floor, not having a full-fledged panic attack and having to call 911 uh, because they don't know what's happening to them. So that is why you know, intervention and prevention is so important. In wealth, we are so very fortunate that we have organizations that excel in the crisis management part. What, where the gap was, was that intervention and prevention, and that's the safety net that the world um, aims to provide. Uh, this is an old slide, but it, it's a really important slide. The Grove was designed to increase service accessibility to youth, availability, increase that sense of belonging, and increase services to Wellington County. And we hit the check marks on all of those goals. What we're seeing today in Wellington County, and this slide is uh, uh, from uh, April, so um, our numbers are even higher than this, um, because uh, in May and the beginning of June, we've seen a, a rapid increase um, in utilizing our services. But 8,991 8, youth participated in a range of activities. 
uh, drop-in wellness recreational activities, uh, employment and education visits. We partnered with the University of Guelph. We've got University of Guelph students um, being zoomed in to some of our sites in Wellington County to help youth with their applications to university and colleges. Or, you know, here's um, some avenues that you can explore in um, trying to, uh, uh, when you're trying to decide what, um, what uh, career you want to uh, uh, participate in. The other thing we're doing, which is um, pretty innovative, is we're uh, going, I have a meeting tomorrow to talk to um, the uh, uh, recruiter at Linamar to talk about how do we get some Linamar employees or employees from different uh, companies coming in and talking about the trades and talking about career opportunities for our youth. Um, we've seen 880 walk-in counseling visits, 16 for substance use support, and um, and 15 youth um, that regularly come in for two SLGBTQ plus support. And over 90% as we measure everything, of uh, youth rate their experience as excellent um, growth. The sites now open, I talked about Wellington County sites. Uh, the University of Guelph has been a partner from the very beginning of this, since 2018. Um, and they've given us very graciously 2,000 square feet um, on the corner of uh, College Ave and Smith Lane. So if, if you're looking at OBC from College Ave, it's just to the, to the right. Um, and we're starting to see community youth and university uh, youth start to access that, um, that site. What's key here is this is the first um, site, and we've got lots of people watching us, uh, in Canada where a community has partnered with the university. So lots of people are looking to see, can this work um, at other universities? The YMCA of Three Rivers, which is a Guelph location, we've got mental health services um, uh, supporting them on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. They will be a site um, eventually. Uh, we just have to raise a few more dollars to uh, do the expansion there. They've agreed to do um, 6,000 uh, square feet there. And then who are we helping? Um, I have countless and countless stories um, of youth that we're helping. What I can tell you is that at least once a week, um, we've got a youth who's in our, our site saying that they are not very sure that they want to live. And we're able to help them instantaneously. What else are we seeing? We're seeing lots of kids drop in, lots of tutoring support because they um, were running into trouble with the pandemic and isolation, and so we've got tutoring uh, coming in. Um, we have a youth wellness uh, coordinators um, who are there to help them um, with their um, uh, with intake, and then we have skills and well-being classes uh, to help youth um, uh, uh, cope with uh, their lives. We have a youth ambassador training program, which I talked about. Um, each ambassador are trained on um, how to deliver allyship guides, which were developed with class from uh, the University of Guelph. Um, this is a really good opportunity for me to tell you that youth are really needing this. Um, I see myself as a, a champion of what they are trying to do. So they're developing the allyship guides. They're out there in the school talking about uh, mental health and mental well-being and how to be well. Uh, they're developing the um, art programs and the trivia nights and things like that. It really is a youth-led organization, which is fabulous because if youth are leading it, youth will come. That's what we're finding. We have an equity, diversity, inclusions, and indigenous reconciliation uh, framework, which a youth led for us. And then what we had are co-op students uh, from the University of Guelph, and now we have some summer students that are actually putting this and uh, implementing this plan. This 60-page uh, document uh, that we worked uh, in conjunction with um, the uh, uh, community leaders and community youth and, and the University of Guelph to put the uh, the uh, program together, and it is pretty amazing what these youth are, are coming up with and, and how they want to implement um, uh, some of these programs. 
So Helen and I are here. Uh, we'd we'll be happy to answer any questions. I have left out a million details, but um, very happy to answer any questions if anybody has. Yes, sir. I have a question. That if I'm a young kid in high school, how do I find out what the role is? How, how are you promoting it to the... That's one of the big details I left out. We have a partnership with the uh, Board of Health Boards of Education. We're in the schools. We're delivering programs in the schools, and then teachers are bringing their youth, uh, their classes, to uh, the Grove for uh, tours. It's interesting um, uh, that in September, uh, there was quite a, a lot of uh, bullying happening in uh, Wellington County. And one of the high school principals called us and said, I've got 900 kids spilling out onto the parking lot at lunch. I've got quite a, a bullying issue here. Can I send these 30 to 40 uh, youth over for lunch in a safe place that's supervised? And yes, that's what we're there for. So we do have a $15 million campaign that's happening right now. We've raised 10.5 million to date. So we've got another 4.5 to go to make sure that we get an expansion at Sheldell Family Gateway and at the Wise expansion. And then of course we've got um, uh, 8,000 square feet, which uh, the CMHA building, um, which will be built and open early in the new year and then the University of Guelph site. Are there other questions for our speakers? Yes. Where's the operating money come from? Like one thing has capital, but yeah, good question. Uh, so uh, because we are now an official youth wellness um, uh, Ontario health site, uh, we get six hundred and fifty thousand dollars of operating funds from the government. Each of the hubs get that. We need 650,000 for each of our sites, so we'll be logging um, for more, but um, part of our fundraising campaign was 70% capital, 20% um, uh, operating, and 10% admin. So it's it's a combination. Great question. Other questions? Yes, sir. This, this is kind of specific, but um, you say that if a, a, a youth has reached an outreach worker, and then has a call with calls to the 247 line. Yeah. And they can access their files. How with, you, with the use permission. That's true, but how do you ensure that confidentiality that's really the use on the phone? Especially in cases of bullying where someone else would pretend to be them to get access to information. That would be my concern. Because if somebody's bullying somebody, they know they have a problem. They're going there, they could. Yeah. I just wonder. Sorry. Yeah, they, I, they, there would be certain details that would identify that youth um, from uh, the youth outreachers uh, file and also from here 24-7's file. And make sure. Yeah, comes absolutely. From the youth These are file. trained professionals. Yeah. They, you wouldn't want me on that file, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yes. Does that reduce our reliance on kids who need inpatient care going to Kitchener? Because I know that that's mission the mission of the ER, right? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So our building on Woolwood Street is only for outpatient services. So it's all of the children's mental health services at CMHA and then the girl we wellness hubs on the main floor. Um, sadly, uh, we do not have any residential beds for kids in crisis they still have to go over to the Grand River Hospital beds in uh, Kitchener. That is something we're looking at here locally, but it is a very small number of our kids uh, that need those beds. So it's a very expensive resource for a very small number. Uh, and frankly, our hope is that the more support we provide in the community and can meet those kids you know, proactively uh, Prevention-wise, early intervention, the less they're going to need those residential beds, but we're not quite there yet. Sure. And does Bell Talk Days provide you any financial resources? We apply. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're very uh, diligent about applying, um, but so far we have an application this year, but so far we haven't had any um, funding. Yeah. Generally speaking, Bell Let's Talk money uh, goes to organizations and groups that don't normally get funded. So uh, organizations like us and the Grove who have funding from the government, 
uh, you know, even though we have great ideas and opportunities for things, they will go to community groups and grassroots, uh, things like that, that, you know, do amazing work, right? So they tend to use the money more for those informal grassroots kinds of projects. And we all benefit, to your point, Helen, about yeah. mental health is health. We all benefit from lifting the stigma and more conversations right. around mental health. Probably yeah. helps us all. The other, the other problem with that is it's one-time funding. So if you're trying to build a long-lasting, permanent solution, uh, one-time funding doesn't go very far. Yeah. Right? You can't build a program no, on one-time money because it's there and then gone. It, yeah, and taking, it'd be worse to take it away than it would yeah. have it in the first place. Ian, I wanted to bring you into this conversation. I know you're on the front lines of the when youth are in crisis and that the prevention hopefully diverts. I think you talked about diversion. Yeah, what are your thoughts and comments? I wanted to invite that. Well, I, I'm, I was so impressed by this talk, by the talks from, from Helen and Cindy, that I actually, um, I'm not gonna add my talk into the mix. We, the hospital picks up the, 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 the situations that cannot be managed by, by the community services. And that's the, the, the really extreme cases of, of uh, patients who overdose or who have uh, uh, significant behavioral issues uh, who can't be managed in a safe way at, at home. Um, and the hospital is like, I, I heard a quote the other day, we wouldn't, if, we, if someone has a cancer, we don't wait until they have a grade four cancer before we start intervening. We intervene earlier. This is exactly the, the kinds of work that, that is happening at CMHA and the Grove that is needed to prevent emergency department visits. Emergency department visits are really the last step and in many people's situations, they perceive that the emergency department is the only place that they can go because it's the only place that's open 24-7. Um, but our job as much as possible is to hold those kids and their parents and their, and their, their, so their support systems and uh, find ways that we can safely get them back into a, a safe place uh, so they can be managed by their school counselors, by their personal psychologists, by their psychiatrists, um, and by the, the other services that are available in the community. We've seen a dramatic rise in hospital visits over the last 20 years. Um, nearly a, a doubling of, of uh, hospital visits is what's reported in, in uh, across Canada. And um, a significant uh, increase, 65% increase in kids who are going to inpatient services. Um, those beds are very limited. They're all focused in, in Kitchener or in um, other large centers, Hamilton, Toronto. And so uh, to, it's the prevention is, is the key, to find safe spaces for these kids so they, they don't feel so distressed that they are in, in emerge in crisis. So, so why this increase is because it's more, it's more available, more promoted, or is it just an increase naturally? Why has it increased? Yeah. Uh, I would, as much as uh, technology may have helped us, I think these things actually have a lot to do with it. I, uh, if, if you interview kids about what happened to bring them to emerge, um, I would say 90% of them have something to do with Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or some other tool where there was bullying, there was uh, some sort of events that happened that tipped them over and it's related to social media. We're also uh, just saturated with stress now. Environmental crises, wars, um, mass shootings that are being publicized within instantaneously. And I think it's, uh, it's just having its, its impact. So we need, to, we need to build that resilience and those, those places where kids can um, can feel held in that net that Helen was talking about. Yeah, the other thing, I, heard, I spoke with a child psychiatrist and asked that question, and, and Ian's right. It's about this versus talking. You usually had a friend, you confide in them, you sort of work out your, your issues. 
Meanwhile, you, you use this, and sometimes nasty things come through this. 